Thank you. Hello, everybody. Um, it's delightful to have you here. I know that you'd really rather be outside in, in the yard, in the lawns, um, and so I appreciate your coming inside on this, on this spring day here in Philadelphia. Um, first, I want to thank uh, Boris Bricker and my other hosts for having me out to Villanova this afternoon. It's such a treat to be able to come and talk with you about the writer Svetlana Alexievich. She's a truly important, I think, and fascinating writer, and we've only begun to take to pay attention to her really in the United States now that she's won the Nobel Prize. This, we've done this before with other writers in foreign languages that we really only notice them um, when they win the Nobel Prize. She has been well known uh, and well translated around the world for many years uh, with hundreds of editions of her six major books published in all European languages, in uh, Asian languages, uh, and in English. Her books have also gradually been coming out um, with her most recent book that we'll end with, uh, still in the process of being translated and published. So I really am looking forward to that and I want to recommend it to you in advance, though it's still uh, not out. For us, for students of Russian and post-Soviet space, Alexeyevich uh, serves as a particularly interesting <coughs> lens, it seems to me, into the Soviet century and into Soviet man. So I'm delighted that some of Professor Bricker's students and some of uh, Lynn's students and other, others of you who are here um, have been exploring her works uh, and I look forward to sharing some of my own ideas with you about her this afternoon. So secondly, you know something about me already from that uh, very generous introduction, but let me tell you a little bit more about why I think I have some qualifications to talk and write about Alexeyevich. Um, in one of her interviews, she commented, people are always asking me why I, a woman, am always writing about war. She, she goes on to say that uh, about Soviet and post-Soviet people, we have had no other history. Our entire history is military. We were always at war or preparing for war. We have never lived any other way. So I think probably some of you, uh, especially those of us who are a little older, but even the younger people uh, in the 20th and 21st century are also starting to feel <laughs> that we're always at war and we're always thinking about war. Um, certainly, I've be become very aware of how war looms over our lives. Um, I myself began to study the Russian language in an era when my father was terrified of the Soviet Union. He used to tell me that I would go to visit over his dead body. He's still alive. Uh, sometimes I call myself um, a child of, of Sputnik. Uh, since it was due to the Cold War, the Space Race, and the 1958 National Defense Education Act that my suburban Chicago high school was teaching Russian language when I was there in the late 70s and early 80s. My personal experience of the Soviet Union means that I'm also a child of Glasnost. After I convinced my father it would be okay, I finally spent a semester in Leningrad in the spring of 1987 and I cut my teeth on uh, Gorbachev's famous book of the era, Nova Mushlinia, New Thinking. Am I ahead? Oh, I'm ahead. There we go. Um, and on Pirestroika. Uh, in those heady days of that triple slogan, Pirestroika, Demokratia, Glasnost, the Cold War was almost over. And it was then that Alexeyevich's books began to be published and talked about. Um, I probably first met Boris 25 years ago or more. We were just trying to do the math. Uh, when I was a graduate student at Middlebury College's Russian school, uh, and I've been teaching at Ohio State for over 20 years now. In that time, my interests have focused primarily on questions of genre and voice, particularly in my first book, Writing a Usable Past, uh, which is about biography, um, and uh, more recently on questions of how war has been depicted in Russian literature. So that 2012 book that Boris mentioned, uh, Chapayev and his comrades, essentially makes the same assertion that Alexeyevich makes, that the 20th century was, for the Soviet Union and for Russia, a century of war. In my book, I look at the entire century, but much of the analysis explores the fiction, films, and poetry devoted to the Second World War, what in Russian is usually called the Great Patriotic War a war which dominates Alexeyevich's work and which is still being processed and reprocessed by Russian, Belarusian, Ukrainian, etc., artists, writers, and <coughs> filmmakers. Uh, when Boris first invited me to come speak about Alexeyevich, I was thinking about this question of genre um, and of documentary, and I was thinking about how I might um, 
do a real comparative. I'm sorry. I'm not doing too well on my slides here. I'll be better. Um, I was thinking of doing a really uh, a comparative work of looking at her, let's say, juxtaposing her with Studs Terkel and his working and also his other books about the war, talking with veterans. Um, I was also thinking about some of the other documentary work, especially documentary work out of, um, out of Belarus, uh, filmmakers, for example. Or we could compare him, uh, compare her work to Salgado, to really looking at those individual voices of people who are sometimes forgotten. In the end, um, I'm going to stay with mostly with her work, uh, and uh, maybe some of those other ideas will come up in questions and answers, um, or just later for us all to think about. So, um, in a 2005 article in the Soviet, or in the Russian magazine Iskustvo Kino, um, Russian film scholar Alexander Shpagin. Um, formulated the standard narrative of war like this. The war, he wrote, is the Soviet people's great feat. The war is a test of the soundness of all human qualities. Thanks to war, we saved our own country and the entire world from the Brown Plague. The war represents one of the best pages of our entire history. The article was called The Religion of War. Uh, and in it, he's talking really about that myth. He's not necessarily agreeing with uh, those assessments. But that's how it was for the Soviet people. On this slide, we have uh, Vladimir Makov and his artillery group who placed the Soviet flag on the top of the Reichstag in Berlin on that uh, day, uh, the 30th of April, 1945, when World War II was coming to an end. The narrative of war that Spagen describes was fully functional throughout this, uh, this, uh, the post-war Soviet period. And as we've seen in the news in recent years, militaristic and patriotic government stances and even new legislation uh, in the 21st century are striving to keep that narrative alive. Soviet feats, Russian bravery, the apotheosis of the hero and the heroic. Alexeyevich's work is fully engaged with that Soviet paradigm. Today I want to explore with you her cycle of books, which she calls Voices of Utopia, books written in a genre which she has defined as documentary literary prose. I will draw on the books themselves, on some of Alexeyevich's many interviews, and on the press accounts related to this somewhat surprising Nobel Prize. Although it is not unprecedented, the fact that Alexievich's nonfiction was awarded the world's highest literary prize is certainly noteworthy. In a New Yorker piece from October 2014, Philip Gorevich lobbied for this recognition, arguing that Alexievich uses documentary writing and techniques of investigative journalism to do, he says, what literature does best, which is to respond to life and death with writing that by its voice and its substance, its soul and its urgency, its truth and above all, its wisdom, enlarges our understanding and experience of our world and our being. Gorevich compared nonfiction to photography, long not considered a real art form by the visual art establishment. The power of Alexievich's work, Gorevich predicted, would break that barrier and receive uh, the recognition that it deserved, which 12 months later, it did. In Svetlana Alexeyevich, the Nobel Committee awarded its sixth prize for literature to an author writing in Russian. And its timing once again points to a political message directed at Russia and Russia's militaristic efforts in Ukraine, as well as further afield in Syria. Alexeyevich herself, of course, is not Russian, but Belarusian born in 1948 in what is now the south southwest corner of Ukraine. Although she happened to be at home in Minsk when the Nobel Prize was announced, she's lived in exile for much of the last decade to avoid encounters with Belarus dictator Alexander Lukashenko and his government. In an interview with Anna Lukich, Alexeyevich stated, I would say I'm an independent writer. I can't call myself a Soviet writer or even a Russian writer. By Soviet, I mean the territory of the former Soviet empire, naturally the realm of the Soviet utopia. Neither do I consider myself a Belarusian writer. I would say I'm a writer of that epoch, the Soviet utopia, writing the history of that utopia 
in each of my books. In that sense, Belarus, which under Lukashenko, Alexeyevich has re referred to as a Soviet reservation, uh, makes a good homeland for her, because in the post-Soviet world, Alexeyevich has gone out of her way to remind everyone that she and her former fellow countrymen were and continue to be Soviet. Her books, she says, are an investigation of that Russo-Soviet soul. So in the time remaining to me, I'd like to briefly introduce the five books of Alexeyevich's Voices of Utopia series, talk a little bit about the nature of the Soviet legacy in post-Soviet times, and maybe make some recommendations about how we can approach this author and her work. The genre of human voices, as she has described it, developed gradually and differs slightly in each of the books. Generally speaking, uh, her method is to interview people and then arrange, or the, voice I'm, the word I'm liking to use about this is curate. She's curating their voices into the fabric of this documentary literary prose. Although reviewers have commented on the voiceless narrator and hidden editor in the results, Alexeyevich highlights her active work in the process. She tends to use about 20% of the material that she gathers, and she asserts, my writing is not just all facts and voices. I strive to create a text that works as a sign, pointing out undercurrents that lie beneath the facts. It's important, I think, to remember that Alexeyevich was born in 1948. And she said in discussing her first book, I'm going to give you the whole list here um, so we can follow it, um, uh, The Unwomanly Face of War. Even though she was a child of victory, born three years after the defeat of the Nazis, she wanted to interview women veterans to try to understand the ways in which war permeates consciousness, even the consciousness of those like herself who are not yet born. She says, as children, we knew no world without war. The world of war was the only world we knew, and the people of war were the only people we knew. Even now, I don't know a different world or a different people. Did they ever exist, she asks. A few years ago in the run-up to the 100th anniversary of World War I, I was uh, asked to take part in a project to examine the First World War in so-called post-memory. In other words, in representations by those whose only knowledge and memory of the events could not be firsthand. Born after the war was over, the authors and filmmakers that we explored uh, in that book knew the war only by hearsay. In the Soviet case, which was my article, uh, the two authors I chose to look at were Valentin Pikul and Alexander Solzhenitsyn, both of whom had fathers who served in World War I and who themselves served in World War II. Their representations of the Great War were based on research, interviews, and their own knowledge of, sort of the facts of war from the next one, the Great Patriotic War. For the first two books of her Voices of Utopia series, Alexeyevich was in a similar boat. She's written about how when she was young, all her classmates loved books about the war, thought about the war all the time. And it's no surprise, she added, we were the children of victory, capital V, the children of the victors. These categories really resonated for her and for her generation. Indeed, it was during Alexeyevich's childhood that what Nina Tumarkin calls the organized memorialization of the great patriotic war really took off to shape the childhoods of these children of victory. Alexeyevich comments, what do I remember about the war? My own childish anguish in the midst of incomprehensible and terrifying words. The war was constantly a topic at school and at home, at weddings and christenings, on holidays and at the cemetery, even in the conversations of children. This first book was an attempt to come to terms with the cult of World War II from a different point of view, to recover the experiences of women during the war, experiences that had largely been left out of the cult and the conversation. But Alexeyevich, from the start of her career, thought of the space of war as a kind of country all its own, a feeling of nationhood or of unity that brought all Soviet citizens together. The war and the post-war period, she said, was where our spirits felt at home. Everyone lived there. Everything began with that terrifying world, in our family as well. My Ukrainian grandfather, my mother's father, died at the front. And my Belarusian grandmother, my father's mother, died from typhus in the partisan movement. 
Two of her sons were missing in action. Of the three she sent to the army, only one returned, my father. This, Alexeyevich argued, was the only reality for her family and for her generation writ large. Explaining her method in the first book, Alexeyevich stated, I've been searching for a genre that would allow the closest possible approximation to how I see and hear the world. Finally, I chose the genre of actual human voices and confessions. The book defies characterization, but we'll try anyway. It reads both as a collection of oral histories and as a chronicle of the process of data collection. These data are not statistics about casualties or descriptions of troop movements at the front. They're rather the voices of women, 40 years on, who recall the war in a very personal light. Alexeyevich writes, a woman's war has its own particular language. Men hide behind facts, whereas women evoke feelings. I will repeat, this is a world unlike the masculine one, with smells, with colors, with a detailed world of existence. Filled with primarily women's voices, the unwomanly face of war also includes male voices and the views of men. Sometimes the husbands drill their wives the night before the interview, getting dates and locations straight for the women so that they will be able to, in the husband's minds, answer properly. In other cases, the wives talk about the male point of view. Why interview me, they ask. You should go to my husband. He'll tell you that the names of commanders, generals, the numbers of units, he remembers everything. But I don't. I remember only what happened to me. And here I think we see the crux of Alexeyevich's work, which we will return to at the end of the talk. The idea that individual experience and memory must be valued and must be remembered, particularly as a counterweight to official and collective experience and memory, such as that which, was, which coalesced in the myth and cult of World War II. Even the official cult, we know, did not leave women out entirely, as we see here. This is a, uh, one of these um, celebratory um, images of the telephone operator Olga Yefimenko with her husband, artillery commander Major Pavel Volokh. And Yefimenko herself, she was 26 years old uh, when she blew up a German tank uh, and killed 10 German soldiers on March 3rd, 1944. She was awarded a medal for bravery for this feat. What Hanukseyevich is trying to do in the unwomanly face of war is to take not the official history, but the personal history that these women are telling her. For Alexeyevich, and especially in this first book, uh, when she's working out her method, the process of research is almost as interesting as the results. She foregrounds the endless nature of her research project, discussing the signed and anonymous letters which she received, the chains of human interviews which she conducted. Each interview subject invited a friend to join in or gave Alexeyevich further names of demobilized soldiers and veterans whom she could contact. These two discourses, the official and the personal, began to live in the author, as they do in her subjects. She writes, I often met with this, these two truths that lived in one individual, one's own personal truth driven into the underground, and the foreign truth, the truth that was fed by the spirit of the time. That's how it was, she gives an example, a concrete example, with Nina Yakovlevna. She described one ward to me, and here she's quoting Nina Yakovlevna, uh, as if to my daughter, so that you can understand what we, who were still just girls, had to live through. And a second war meant for a larger audience, the way others tell it, she said, and how it's written about in the papers, about heroes and feats, so that young people can be brought up with high ideals. So that's, just, we could just pause there for a second and think about that. That's really interesting, that there's something that's nasha dievice, something that we women can say to each other that will not inspire those high ideals that are necessary. Uh, this is the character who constantly calls her Dochinka, Dochinka, when she's doing these interviews. Daughter, let me tell you, let me have, have a cup of tea and let me tell you what it was like. And though some of you have been reading these stories, it's fascinating. We'll get to some, some further comments from the censor later, but um, you know, it's fascinating that the, prob the women's problems in war, which certainly did not bother the high command, were some of the things that come back and that are most vivid for these, 
for these uh, women 40 years later, and you can imagine, you know, menstruation, um, all sorts of other, uh, boots, boots are really big. If you read any war literature, boots are really, really key. Um, I have a whole, boots and spoons are the two kind of things that I think are most important in memoirs. Um, did my boots fit? Did they destroy my heels? Did I have to leave them behind during a river crossing and it was the only pair in my size and I'll never find another pair? Um, and spoons, you know, I keep my spoon in my boot. I, I so-and-so taught me how to make a spoon. I had my own spoon and I didn't share it and so on. So those are the things I think are really, if you read enough war literature, that's what you, you tend to think about. Um, all right, so getting back to, to this uh, question of, of the personal and the official. Uh, the things that we can say to each other over a cup of tea and the things uh, that we have to say in order to raise up our young people so that they can maintain their high ideals. Uh, Lisa Kirchenbaum uh, has written about the coexistence of levels of truth in wartime accounts of the blockade of Leningrad. And we can use a similar tool to understand Alexeyevich's chronicle of women's experiences in war. In this case, the two levels had a slightly different meaning, the truth of experience as people perceive their own situation and some kind of truth, as Kirchhoff writes, that was necessary to convince them of the need for continued resistance. In a retrospective sense, that wartime propaganda became those myths, uh, to use Kirchhoff's uh, definition of the term, that became history with a capital H, or what she calls memory created from above as opposed to the personal stories that remained a part of memory or the everyday memory of survivors. I love that image of memory created from above. When we think about our memories, of course, we have to put them in boxes or in categories of some, time, some kind, but to have them put into a crate by somebody more official, more serious, more important somehow than we are um, changes the, the nature of that memory, doesn't it? So these two coexisting truths, the personal and the official, are in many cases in the unwomanly face of war gendered, female and male. Even during the war and within a single individual, these two discourses, the official and the personal, lived side by side. One woman soldier describes how they functioned together, helping her to become an anti-aircraft gunner. She said, I remember that at a political meeting, uh, at political meetings they would read Ilya Ehrenberg's kill him. Every time you meet a German, that's how many times you should kill him. It's a famous article. At that time, she says, everybody read it, memorized it. It made a strong impression on me. I carried this article uh, in my bag throughout the whole war, along with Papa's death notice. To shoot, to shoot, she said. I must take revenge. So in this conversation with uh, Alexeyevich, veteran Valentina Chudaeva uses the imperfective aspect of the verb, not atamstit, committing a specific one-time act of vengeance for the death of her father at the hands of the fascists, but mstit, I must avenge continually without end. She uses propaganda to translate her private grief into an anger that can sustain her throughout the entire war. Believing that she is heeding Ilya Ehrenberg's call, though, Chudaeva also, I think, echoes the imperfective Mstila, Mstila, Mstila from a 1942 poem by an official female voice, Olga Bergolz, um, called February Diary. We can see the influence of Olga Bergolz's wartime poetry and of the merged category uh, of official and female. Bergolz lived through the 900 days uh, of siege the 900 day siege of Leningrad, and famously declaimed her poetry on the radio for her fellow blockadniki, uh, those in the blockade. In so doing, she gained an authoritative voice that affects the private words, I think, of Alexeyevich's interview subjects when they finally speak years later. As women warriors, they've been taught to remain silent. But in Bergolz's poem written during the siege, hatred keeps the blockadniki alive. Hatred and the desire for revenge. Seems to me that we hear, hear we, that here we hear the echo of that official female discourse, recalled as the individual and personal in Chudayeva's story, decades later. And that's one of the things that makes this particular genre, this interview genre, and genre of voices, especially with such a long um, lag time between events um, and and uh, memories. It makes it so interesting to try to filter out what are the influences on those personal feelings. We have feelings, we think there are feelings, 
But if we dig deeper, we realize that somebody planted those feelings. I mean, you can think about this from your own childhood memories. Do you really remember that thing that happened when you were a year and a half? Or is it something that you've heard stories about and somebody else's discourse is imposed on you? In this case, in the Soviet case, I think we see that mixing of discourses. So conceiving of World War II as a state of mind, not just a historical event or as propaganda to buttress fading Soviet patriotism, Alexievich launched a second book project, which she called Last Witnesses. Uh, it draws on interviews with Soviet citizens who had had wartime childhoods. Um, so I'm going to show you here a slide with this title that is related but different from this, um, this book of Alexievich's. Um, this is a, there is, this is a, well you can see what this is. What are these people doing? Standing in line, which is a, a, again, if you're looking for some sort of lens through which to examine Soviet history, the line, I can give you a reading list, the line works very, very well. But in this wonderful production in the Rizan, which just premiered last year, I think, um, for the 70th anniversary um, of the end of World War II, uh, it's based on Ludmila Ulitskaya's project, uh, Childhood 45 to 53. Um, and I was talking with Boris about this last summer. Uh, this is just an, it's a fascinating project that Ulitskaya launched. She's one, if you don't know her, um, when you're reading Soviet, post-Soviet and late Soviet and post-Soviet short stories, she's a great person to read because I'm just going to tell you, her stories are not always, they don't always have unhappy endings. I know, it's really shocking. The first novel I ever taught of hers is called The Funeral Party, and you'd think that's probably a little depressing, but honestly, it ends quite well. Just telling you. Um, so uh, this project of hers, uh, Ulitskaya herself was born, um, oh, now I've forgotten. She was born during the war. Uh, she was born in, a, she was in what we call in evacuation. Um, I think she was in Ufa when she was born. 44, 45. Was she born in 44? Right at the end, right at the end of the war. Um, and so she herself, she's written some stories about post-war childhood that are really beautiful and really interesting, some skusky that haven't been translated yet, some, some fairy tales that I've been teaching with my, some of my students. But this project, which also has not been translated, um, she reached out, it started out as kind of an internet project and then it got bigger and she reached out and sort of elicited childhood memories from people of her generation um, and put them together in a book. Uh, and it's a really interesting book. It is less successful than... Alexievich's book, which is why Lutska is not yet a Nobel Prize winner. Um, but I would love to go to Rizan. I've never, has anybody been to Rizan? I haven't been to go and see this production. It's actually on, it was on yesterday, but I was busy. Okay, so <laughs> just to continue, um, so, so in the introduction um, to, uh, so I, I'm calling this, this thing of Lutska as a kind of a crowdsourced history of childhood. Uh, in World War II. Uh, it's a very interesting book. But again, these two books of Alexievich's are, are much, I think, more effective. So in the introduction to Last Witnesses, Alexievich writes, war was the shared biography of an entire generation of wartime children. Even if they were located at the rear, they were still wartime children. Today, she continued, they are the last witnesses of those tragic days. So these voices, when she interviews them, and again, this, these books both came out in 1985, um, the people are grown up already by the time she interviews them, but the voices retain the child's experience of war, which was so well depicted um, in the transformation of the protagonist, Florida, in uh, Yelem Klimov's uh, 1985 film, Come and See. Has anybody seen this film? I hope so. Um, so uh, in that film... It doesn't end well. But if you know, okay, I told you, Ulitska ends well. Don't, anything else you could just fill in the blank. It doesn't necessarily end well. Uh, my students sometimes complain when I only teach them murders and suicides. But it's what's interesting. So uh, in this film about the horror of, horrors of war in Belarus, it could only have been made and released uh, during Perestroika, um, uh, we see a young protagonist, um, can't see him super well here, but he looks a little scared. It's wartime, right? Um, and we see his transformation um, through the course of these really horrific events as he becomes a partisan and watches his family and everyone he knows um, and many other people uh, be tortured and killed. 
Um, it reminds me very much of one of the stories from Last Witnesses in conversation with uh, a, a boy, Vas, uh, Vasya Tashonak, who was 10 years old during the war. Um, Alexeyevich reports him remembering, from the very first bomb, when I saw it falling, I was already not I. It was some other person. At any rate, there was no child left in me anymore. Or maybe the child continued to live in me, but next to him was another person entirely. So these films, if you, if you, if you do, you know, do a little Google search of come and see images, these are, the, these are the images that you will see. But this one in particular, when he has already been in the forest for a long time, is absolutely crazed. Um, it's a really incredibly strong and difficult uh, but important film. Um, Alexeyevich, in her interviews, watches the parallel existence of two people in every interview subject. What they experienced as children is what they remembered. And in this sense, she says what they are telling is an authentic document, even though the speakers are already adults. She can hear those children's voices. Thus, the protagonist, she says, of Last Witnesses is childhood itself. Uh, the childhood that was set on fire, she writes, shot, killed by bombs, bullets, starvation, fear, fatherlessness. Those are the experiences of that wartime childhood. For us today, of course, the stories of refugees fleeing war are the same voices we hear on the radio on our way to work. They fed us, and they never even mentioned money. Or, hordes of refugees filled the roads. These are familiar words to us today, and they help us think about how Alexeyevich's genre of voices has its roots in journalism, but also how it chronicles the humanitarian disasters, not just of the past, but actually of the present. Uh, the famous Belarusian teenaged partisan turned writer, Alice Adamovich, who served as a mentor to Alexeyevich, has written about how, in both of these first two books, the vivid voices remind us of the strongest literary texts. And in writing about them, Alexeyevich uh, became part of real literature, alongside veteran Soviet war writers like uh, Konstantin Simonov, uh, Vasil Buikov, Daniel Granin. Her talents of selection and montage, along with the material she elicited through her empathetic interviewing, he used to tease her, condemned her to success. I think he anticipated the Nobel. Alexeyevich herself grew up after the war, in that time of post-memory, but given the strength of the World War II cult and, Soviet, and the Soviet propaganda machine and her own family's tragic fate, she felt as if she too had had a wartime childhood. Speaking with those last witnesses, giving them voice to fill in the official stance of no one is forgotten, nothing is forgotten, lines from another Bergolt's poem which are on the wall at Piskaryovsky Cemetery in Leningrad, the, in St. Petersburg now, the cemetery where, if you go to St. Petersburg, you should go to the cemetery with its mass graves. It's really quite, uh, quite an experience. Um, so giving, the vo giving voice to these last witnesses was Alexeyevich's debt to the generation that had just preceded her. After all, she recognizes that this could have been her, the terror, the fear, the loneliness the hunger. As Valya Matushkova, who was age five during the war, recalled, I can remember being in a children's home, surrounded by barbed wire. There wasn't much food, only some kind of bread, which made our tongues swell and we couldn't even talk. We thought about nothing but food. The little ones crawled under the barbed wire and ran into the city. This is all happening near Minsk. We had one goal only, the trash heap. What joy when we found a herring skin or some potato peels. We ate those peels raw. These are the voices that Alexeyevich has saved for history. The women's and children's voices are just as much a part of the story of the Soviet Union and of World War II as the men's voices, even if they were for the most part silenced until 1985. Probably, she wrote in the introduction to The Unwomanly Face of War, some will doubt. They will say, memories, that isn't history and it's not literature. But for me, it is precisely there in the living human voice, in a live reproduction of the past, that primeval joy is hidden and the tragedy of life is revealed.
Life's chaos and its absurdity, passion and barbarity, this is where they are authentic. Not yet cleaned up and edited. It's interesting that she uses that expression because, of course, she's curating these voices. It's interesting. She takes this raw material and shapes it a little bit, but tries to maintain that raw quality, that quality of authenticity. So it's here, too, I think, that Alexievich sets up the overarching theme of her cycle, Voices of Utopia. It's not actually clear to me that she knew <laughs> which five books were going to be a part of this cycle, or at any rate, whoever's monitoring her website didn't necessarily know. She still mentions her fourth book on the website as, as part of the list, uh, which is called Enchanted by Death. Um, it's about people who commit suicide. Um, and there are stories in her last book that are very much related to that same set of interviews, I think. Um, I haven't actually myself been able to get my hands on that book. Uh, I don't have it, access to it through our libraries. Um, but the website doesn't yet mention her most recent book, which we'll talk about, uh, Secondhand Time. But already with the first two books, she's writing about the Soviet person, not the Russian or the Belarusian. This makes total sense, of course, uh, in an era, 1985, when no one would have predicted the end of the Soviet Union, the era that Alexei Yurchuk has called everything was forever until it was no more in his now famous uh, 2006 analysis of the end days of Soviet society. Um, about her heroines, the women veterans in Unwomanly Face, Alexievich writes uh, in the preface to a 2003 edition of the book, who are they, Russian or Soviet? They were Soviet. The Russians and the Belarusians and the Ukrainians and the Tajiks. They really did exist, those Soviet people. And yes, they did have the gulag, but they also had the victory. And here once again, Pabieda with a capital P. This victory, she argues, also belonged to the women. And in, in, in this later edition of Wars on Womanly Face, she cites conversations with the censor, who encouraged her to bury the women's voices again. Yes, the censor said, the victory was difficult to achieve, but you must seek heroic examples. There are hundreds of them. Instead, you show the war's dirt, its undergarments, Nizhny Bilyo. In your rendition, victory is terrifying. What are you trying to get at? And Alexeyevich answers simply, the truth, pravda. So I realize that I've used up lots and lots of my time here already. This task that I've set myself to, uh, to talk about all five books of the uh, Voices of Utopia is foundering on the details and on the voices, on the power of Alexeyevich's work, which is so very vivid. But we'll go on and we'll try to kind of speed through the end so we can get to some, some chatting. Um, some people have argued that th one of the main reasons for the collapse of the Soviet Union, and even for Gorbachev's new thinking in Perestroika, was precisely the Soviet war in Afghanistan. Indeed, we can read between the lines in Gorbachev's own book to discern the anxieties of the late Soviet period. Gorbachev wrote in 1988, in the book he published simultaneously in English and in Russian, uh, an attempt to reach across the Cold War divide, quote, People need to determine where they are, to understand the problems facing humanity, to clarify for themselves how to go on living. Perestroika is essential for a world filled with nuclear weapons, a world where there are serious economic and ecological problems, where there is poverty, backwardness, disease. The human race today must confront head-on the need to assure its own survival. Uh, in Alexeyevich's third book, known in English as Zinke Boys, it was the myth of victory of the heroic Soviet soldier that made the horror of Afghanistan even worse. She quotes her interview subjects saying things like, I went to the great patriotic war and I ended up at an entirely different war. Or, I wanted to be a hero and now I don't know what they've made me into, what I've been turned into. Or, the myth of brotherhood at the front was born here in the Soviet Union. There, in Afghanistan, it simply didn't exist. The narrative of Zinke Boy starts in 1986 when Alexeyevich realizes that having spent five years interviewing people and writing about World War II, she has the opportunity to witness an actual war in person. She and all Soviet citizens had been hearing about Afghanistan since the beginning, in 1979, but it didn't seem like a war at all. As one of her informants, a nurse from Leningrad, reminds her, 
This war, we were told, was a righteous one. We were helping the Afghan people put an end to feudalism and build a bright socialist future. It was somehow not mentioned that our boys were dying there and what they were dying of. If anything, we understood that there were a lot of infectious diseases, malaria, typhus, hepatitis. Alexeyevich herself was sick of war in 1986, but by 1988 she found herself on a plane as an embedded journalist on her way to Afghanistan. Having resisted the call, she now went to see just what was happening in Afghanistan. Were the soldiers really fulfilling their international duty? Or were those boys coming home in sealed zinc coffins, dying of something other than disease? This book contains a very strong journalistic voice, perhaps because her experiences seemed even more personal and personally devastating. She wrote, war is not an event. Um, it is its own world. Here, of course, in Russian it works better. Vaina, mir, ani sabutia. Everything here is different. The landscape, the people, the words. It's the theatrical aspect of war that seems most striking. A tank turns around, orders are barked, the shining paths of bullets in the darkness. She writes, I don't have to invent anything. Excerpts of great books are all around in every soldier. In Afghanistan, Alexeyevich discovered what she'd already known from her first two books, that the horrors of war, particularly given the levels of incompetence in the Soviet military, the lack of supplies and even food, matched only by the lack of humanity within the army itself, uh, in the famous Didovshina, among other things, um, and toward the Afghan people, were an indictment of the system she lived in, of the Soviet Union as a whole. The hypocrisy of rhetoric and propaganda were matched by the dehumanizing daily lives of the soldiers. Those who returned from Afghanistan were crippled, both physically and psychologically. And many of them returned in sealed coffins, the famous zinc coffins, which give her book its name. So I also want to recommend, as we're thinking about movies to see later tonight, it's on YouTube, um, I think with subtitles, is uh, this uh, Alexei Balabanov film, uh, from 2007 called Cargo 200. Um, the very words Cargo 200 help us remember that in, in the military everything is coded. Cargo 200 meant uh, a load of bodies, a load of fatalities. Cargo 300 is a plain load full of uh, wounded soldiers needing transport. For an epigraph to Zinke boys, Alexeyevich took statistics from a political blog uh, from 2003. 2003. Um, in December 1979, the Soviet leadership decided to introduce troops into Afghanistan. The war went on from 79 to 89. It lasted nine years, one month, and 19 days. More than half a million soldiers passed through Afghanistan. The Soviet armed forces sustained 15,051 fatalities. 417 military personnel were missing in action or prisoners of war. By the year 2000, 287 men remained unaccounted for. If in the unwomanly face of war and last witnesses, Alexeyevich was preserving the voices of women and children, reintroducing them as an additional unofficial part of the history of World War II, in her next two books, she really uh, earned her stripes as an investigative reporter, bringing to light the devastation of a Soviet government gone wrong. Zinke Boys was perhaps the most difficult and most controversial of, of Alexeyevich's books, one for which she was actually taken to court by some of her interview subjects after the fact, the veterans themselves and especially their mothers. She records their feelings in the book at the end. What do we need with your horrific truth, they said to her. I don't want to know it. You are dreaming of becoming famous on the blood of our sons. And then there was Chernobyl. Voices from Chernobyl or in Russian, a Chernobyl prayer, connects these two Soviet catastrophes. I had just come home from Afghanistan, Alexeyevich reports a soldier saying. When I made it back from Afghanistan, I knew that I'd live. Here, it was the opposite. It would kill you only after you got home. Subject after subject notices. You can't compare it to a war exactly, but everyone compares it anyway. Alexeyevich interviewed soldiers, engineers, chemists, doctors, wives of the responders, pregnant women whose fetuses were born later, without fingers, without eyes, firemen, 
environmental inspectors. The meltdown of the nuclear reactor at Chernobyl affected a large area, but no place more than Belarus, where the damage can indeed be compared to that of World War II. Uh, if in the war, one in four Belarusians was killed, and 619 villages were documented as being destroyed. After Chernobyl, 2.1 of Belarus's population of 10 million people now live on contaminated land. 485 villages were lost forever. Environmental and health effects are still being seen throughout Russia, Ukraine, and Scandinavia. But in Belarus, 23% of the territory was contaminated, compared to 4.8% in Ukraine and 0.5% in Russia. And 26% of the forests are contaminated. So if one quarter of the population of Belarus was destroyed in World War II, the Soviet nuclear accident destroyed one quarter of the land. Our system, one subject states, is a military system, essentially. And it works great in emergencies, except when it doesn't work so great, like Chernobyl. Chernobyl split the Soviet consciousness. Witnesses were still sorting through their reactions when they spoke with Alexeyevich. Why did we keep silent, they asked, knowing what we knew? Why didn't we go out onto the square and yell the truth? We compiled our reports, we put together explanatory notes, um, but we kept quiet and carried out our orders without a murmur because of party discipline. I was a communist. We had faith that we lived well and fairly, that for us man was the highest thing, the measure of all things. For scientists and party functionaries in particular, the conflict between the, what the government was saying about the accident and the facts as they knew them and as they were affecting their own families made Chernobyl into an even more significant event. One witness recalled, I think I understood then, for the first time, a bit of what it was like in 1937, how that felt. Drawing a comparison to Stalinist repressions and the fear and helplessness, even of those not arrested and to the split consciousness required to know one thing and say something entirely different. Another said, Chernobyl happened and suddenly you got this new feeling. We weren't used to it, that each person's life was completely separate from everyone else's. So as we start to think about what the Soviet mindset was and what that end of the Soviet period, those events did to that mindset, it's really quite traumatizing. This was a new kind of disaster, not a war, but an infection. The atom, one witness marveled, is everywhere, in the bread, in the salt. We breathe radiation. We eat it. Traditional Russian hospitality, chlebasoistva, bread and salt, was poisoned. The air was poisoned. The earth is poisoned. Poignant stories throughout the book remind us that memories were also contaminated. The graves of people's ancestors, but also their cats, and their family photos, and their war medals, and their school papers, and their very homes. The Soviet system was contaminated too, destroyed beyond repair. It wasn't just the reactor that exploded, one uh, witness says, but an entire system of values. As another father put it, I want to bear witness my daughter died because of Chernobyl, and they want us to forget about it. Again, so I'm in the movie, apparently I'm in the business of recommending movies. <laughs> I actually only read books, but <laughs> there was a ma an amazing, amazing 15-minute um, uh, film made by a woman named Juanita Wilson and nominated uh, in 2010 for an Oscar short called The Door. Again, it's available. Um, on, uh, easily on the web. Um, I particularly like the amateur reviewer I found who writes for a blog called uh, the Larson Film Review, whose reaction to the film was, quote, an incredibly depressing film about a family that lived in Chernobyl during the nuclear accident in the 1980s. It didn't teach me anything and was just sad. <laughs> So it's true, of course, it's incredibly sad, but if, if you read the, read the book and then you watch this film, it's a beautiful evocation of the, the horror of leaving everything you've ever known behind. Um, people at the time snuck back 
they took things and therefore irradiated their new homes. Um, now, as you may know, you can actually go to Ukraine and take a tour of the zone of exclusion. People have snuck back and are living there. Uh, in particular, people either who feel like they're near death and what's the point, or people who were Russians and fleeing from wars in other parts of the post-Soviet uh, space. Um, a lot of people who had been living in Tajikistan or uh, Azerbaijan or other places uh, were looking for somewhere to live and they went back and they've recolonized this area. So it's a really fascinating uh, situation. Um, that betrayal um, and the betrayal of Afghanistan, so the betrayal of Chernobyl and the betrayal of Afghanistan helped to bring the Soviet system crashing down. Voices from Chernobyl, Alexeyevich explained in an interview, is not about the Chernobyl disaster as such, why it exploded and how, but about the world after Chernobyl, about how people reacted to it and lived through it individually. It is not only about the damage Chernobyl did to nature and to human genetics, but how those experiences affected people's lives and consciousness. While Chernobyl created new fears and sensibilities, Alexeyevich wrote, it obliterated some of the old ones. Fear of communist authorities eroded when many faced with the choice of fleeing, removing their families from danger, or staying in Chernobyl and staying loyal to the party, left. Fear of radiation did in this way relieve or at least lessen their fear of party bosses and party authority. That the authorities were willing to put down their party cards in order to escape really emphasized amidst a climate, a government denial, the seriousness of the Chernobyl disaster. Most people, she writes, knew nothing about the side of Chernobyl. The book inspired precisely the reactions I had in mind when I was writing it. People beginning to think about the meaning of their lives and life in general, feeling the need for a new worldview, one that may save us all. Um, for this Chernobyl project, as for most of her books, Alexeyevich interviewed about 500 people, and she usually tends to include about 100 different voices when she puts it together. She says, since I was, we were confronted with a new reality, this question of atomic fallout was just too hard for anyone to understand. The world was a different world. And so she said, I was on the lookout for people who had been shattered by that experience setting them thinking about what had really happened, what was going on in a new world that they were trying to confront with old methods. For instance, I recall military helicopters piloted by the Soviet Afghan pi war pilots flying over the burning reactor. They had no idea what they were supposed to do with their machine guns. I read somewhere that they were dumping sand on the fires, which apparently made it ex much, much worse, exacerbated the problems of the fallout. Uh, Alexeyevich continues, that was how the army system worked. They believed that massive military personnel and war technology would solve any problem. And there they had to deal with high energy physics, nuclear particles, radiation doses. No one really understood what was going on. So in these two books, Zinke Boys and Voices from Chernobyl, Alexeyevich documented the end of the Soviet era. The Soviet propaganda machine was unable to sustain the cover-up of these humanitarian and environmental disasters. And with her documentary literary prose, with her rescue of these human voices and the spirit of glasnost and demokratia, Alexeyevich struck her own blow at the Soviet system. So I just want one and a half minutes of your time to talk about her new book, Secondhand Time, in which Alexeyevich explores what she calls the only communist plan that worked. The attempt to remake humanity, which resulted in the creation of Homo Sovieticus, of Soviet man. In this book, which again collects all kinds of voices, men and women and children, veterans and scientists and pensioners, communists and fascists and erstwhile dissidents, she details the repercussions of the Soviet century, of Soviet civilization. I am rushing, she says, to capture its traces. It was a great country where we had to stand in line for toilet paper. Um, this is a, 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 an interesting project called Soviet Ghosts, uh, which is not just former Soviet territory, but it includes other parts um, of the former Soviet bloc uh, by a British photographer named Rebecca Batori, uh, recently came out, 2013. 
Um, so in this great country, it was a great hundred. And we, we, I was thinking about this in the translation. You know, I translated and I think it was a great country where we had to wait in line for toilet paper. That sounds like irony, but she's not being ironic. She's saying it was a great country. We thought it was a great country. We were sure we lived in a great country. And coincidentally, we also stood in line for toilet paper. Those two things were just a part of the Soviet world. Um, the same uh, subject states, I can vividly recall the smell of Soviet cafeterias and Soviet stores. This is a full, we were talking about the, the, all of the sensations of Russian orthodoxy. The so Soviet life also accessed all your sensations, not necessarily um, as nicely as incense and candles. Um, so Alexeyevich reminds her Russian readers that post-Soviet time is second-hand time a time that is striving to incorporate the ideas and material possessions from the West into the civilization that remains after a long and bloody Soviet century. I don't ask people, she says, about socialism. I ask about love, jealousy, childhood, old age, music, dances, life's hairstyles, the myriad sundry details of a vanished way of life. This is the only way, she writes, to chase the catastrophe into the framework of the mundane an attempt to tell a story. It seems to me that in this last book in particular, Alexeyevich is summing up the Soviet century, honoring the feelings and experiences of those who lived through it, whether she agrees with them or not. Millions of people live in the territory of the former Soviet empire, and the tragedy visited upon them continues to affect them, their descendants, and their neighbors near and far. There was something perhaps inherently wrong in the Soviet ideology, and her interview subjects seemed to recognize it. Yes, yes, one of her women, a 57-year-old doctor, recalls, the greatest dream was to die, to sacrifice oneself. The Komsomol pledge was, I am ready to give my life if my people needs it. And these were not just words, she says. The woman doctor continues, no one will ever convince me that life is given to us only so that we can eat a tasty morsel and have a good sleep. Or that a hero is someone who bought something in one place and sold it for three kopecks profit in another. It turns out that all those who gave their lives for others, for elevated ideals, were fools. And she can't accept this. I think it's never easy to translate Alexeyevich's titles into English, but this last one, Vreme Second Hand, I think incorporates within it a couple of really important points which illustrate the contradictions of the post-Soviet era. Many of us here in the U.S. Uh, have grown up with used clothing stores. You know, I personally, we buy our clothes at Goodwill, then we wear them for a while, then we return them to Goodwill, right, and we go buy something else. Uh, we think nothing of this kind of economy. But for Alexeyevich in post-Soviet society, the secondhand clothing industry, which took off uh, in post-Soviet Russia, represents several things. The charity kind of forced upon a people who thought they were living in a great country. One of the impoverished parishioners in second-hand time rejects uh, the German human humanitarian aid of the early 90s, uh, preferring to suffer rather than take jam or coffee from the enemy whom the Soviets vanquished. Um, so the buying and selling uh, mentality of capitalism is something that's really very hard for Soviet citizens to swallow. It feels so form foreign to them. Um, the invasion of the English language in the 90s, especially, uh, into everything, especially for older people, this was really tricky. Uh, everything from Lipton and Twining's tea to Snickers and Mars bars. Um, for a people uh, who were hoping for what they used to call a happy end, second hand has a very hollow sound. Ideas, too, in post-Soviet space are recycled, particularly as the 21st century settles into new patterns. Old-fashioned ideas, Alexeyevich writes, are being resurrected. Ideas of great empire, of an iron hand, of a special Russian path. The Soviet hymn is back. The Komsomol, though it's now called ours, or Nashi. Uh, the party in power, copying the Communist Party. The president has power like the Gensek of old. Uh, the general secretary of the Communist Party. Absolute power. Instead of Marxism-Leninism, Russian Orthodoxy. These recycled ideas, she writes, these second-hand ideas, fill a void for post-Soviet citizens, for post-Soviet civilization. With Alexeyevich as our guide, we can start to try to understand the legacy of the Soviet Union and the future 
of the post-Soviet states. And she argues it's hugely important for those who lived through it to try to understand the meaning and repercussions of Soviet life, of what she calls the Soviet continent, Matirik, the land of utopia. If you look back, she writes, at the whole of our history, both Soviet and post-Soviet, it is a huge common grave and a bloodbath, an eternal dialogue of the executioners and the victims, the accursed Russian questions, what is to be done and who is to blame, the revolution, the gulags, the Second World War, the Soviet-Afghan war hidden from the people, the downfall of the great empire, the downfall of the giant socialist continent, the land of utopia, and a challenge of cosmic dimensions, Chernobyl, a challenge for all the living things on Earth. Such, she writes, is our history. It is important, perhaps, it's perhaps just as important for us as outsiders to try to understand both that past and that future. Alexeyevich, the 215, 2015 uh, Nobel Prize winning author of literary nonfiction, has curated the voices of utopia for us. And it's our job to listen to what those voices are telling us. Thank you. Not a lot of jokes, um, but uh, I'd be happy to take <laughs> questions if you have any questions. I could tell you some good Soviet jokes and post-Soviet jokes. Does anybody have any questions? You want to talk about something that you've been reading? How Russians can uh, shake off this narrative of war? It's so, such prevalent in their psyche, you know, and in, in a sense, uh, they are waiting for Putin to deliver something One of the things um, that I think we have to really think about is the 1990s. What happened in the 1990s for Russians was absolutely tragic. Um, the, the, the economic shifts that happened so quickly. Um, older people suffered through a lot of horrible things and now even those memories or those sort of, the, the value that they found in that suffering has been taken away from them too. And so when somebody says something, yes, your suffering was valid and worthy, um, the voices in this last book are just amazing. They, the, these older people saying things like, um, there was nothing in our life. The only good thing was the war and even that was horrible. Or why did we, I keep waiting. They said, you know, wait a little while. Wait a little while, good things are coming. Wait a little while, good things are coming. They never came and now they're worse than ever. You know, so I, I can absolutely see these people, you know, we sometimes from, from our perspective, we look and we see life in the capitals. Um, but some of the films that have been coming out lately, especially Leviathan, some of the other ones, which really show us life in the parts of Russia that you forget about, where it is really grim. Um, so I, those people want hope, and I don't know what we can, you know, we can't do anything. Um, I don't know how we can counter it. I don't, I don't blame them for wanting some, some hope and some glory, you know, some past glory. It's hard. Yeah. Yeah. Just uh, yes, uh, did I understand you correctly that during our shared light lunch that you said you need to have a reverence for your own father? Oh, I was only saying that my father, um, my father was very, uh, uh, so I was a child of the 70s, you know, and I, I remember going to Russia and people saying things to me like, well, you know, weren't you afraid to come here, you know, Cold War, and I said, I wasn't afraid, I mean, I didn't pay any attention, you know, but my father's generation, you know, they, of course, my father was also afraid of me going to New York, so, because <laughs> in the 70s, New York might have been scarier than some parts of the Soviet Union, I don't know. Um, but that was my reference. No, my, my family is not a, I, I just got lucky that I studied Russia and Russian, if you consider this to be lucky. Um, uh, I, I'm, you know, my family's German farmers from downstate Illinois, pig farmers and, you know, whatnot. A few lawyers here and there. So, okay. yeah. Any other questions? Thoughts, yeah, Adele? Uh, thank you, Nadia. That was absolutely terrific. And now set my reading list, my summer reading list. Um, what has, what kind of readership does Alexievich have in Russia, Belarus, Ukraine, in the Russophone areas? 
It's a really good question. Um, and I have to say, I don't know. But I, you know, her books are published and republished. Um, they are controversial, which makes people read them. Um, one of the things I found really fascinating is, as I try to sort through, just from looking at the books themselves, is the way the books live in history, so that she will add a new preface, add a new afterword, add new excerpts from her, from her diaries. Um, Adamovich complained that, especially I think in her first book, he felt like, or sec maybe her second book, he felt like she wasn't foregrounding herself enough. But by adding in all of these extra pieces, she really foregrounds her own struggles uh, with the experience. So she's pretty, she's certainly extremely well, um, she, you know, has numbers of awards from organizations in and around Europe. Um, but I don't know enough about what her, her readership is. They're there. Um, and if I may ask a, a somewhat related, no, it's not really a related question. Uh, we judge a work of literature not only by its subject and its themes, but also by the, its style and its language. So uh, yeah. is she, are, are these books of hers polyphonic in that, mm -hmm. that she reproduces the way her informants are speaking or so would you read them or would you read them for the the style and the language or is there really not a un uniform well so it's not uniform it is polyphonic um people have tried to come up with names for this genre they call it you know a, a multi-voiced oratorio or something um for me the stories themselves are fascinating and the language is fascinating, which is why it's, I think, one of the reasons that they're very hard to translate. I mean, just the titles are impossible. Wainlini Zhenske Lutso is a nice title. The unwomanly face of war doesn't really even make that much sense in English, you know, so, um, or nice title. I mean, it's a title that really says something to you. So the thing, you know, as a literary scholar, I would say that um, I, I, I really value, she has, you know, tons and tons and tons and tons. She takes tons and tons of tape. So when she interviewed people, she, she did not you know, take notes. She was actually taping. So these are real voices. Um, she then burned a lot of her tapes uh, when she was done, I think, with the first couple of books at any rate, because she didn't want anybody to, to have access to it. Um, she will go back to her notebooks. The thing that's most interesting, maybe from a literary point of view, is, the, is what I call the curation, this um, and in each book, it's slightly different, but this uh, grouping of voices around a topic, um, sometimes the headings, uh, the, sometimes there'll be little blurbs, um, even sometimes her voice will come in in the middle of an interview and she'll put in parentheses and italics, um, here she was silent. Right? So you get a lot of that experience. Um, you feel like you're there drinking that cup of tea sometimes with the people. And then you stand back and you look at the, the sections, uh, the, the subheadings, and those are where her overt artistry, I think, shows up. But again, I, I find it really fascinating that um, I was so excited to learn about Ulitska's project, because I adore Ulitska. She's somebody I teach, she's somebody I write about. Uh, and I wasn't excited about this book at all, um, compared to Alexeyevich. It's just not as good which is interesting. So that means that the raw material is out there, but, it's, but she's, uh, yeah, she's filtering it and, and creating that montage. And it takes a very, very special writer to make it happen. And that's, I think, again, why this is controversial. Because really, I mean, you know, as some people say, you know, well, anybody could do that. And of course, the answer is, well, right, but only she did. Right? And well, she did it this well. Yeah. I'm curious in relation to that last question about readership. Do they still publish the tirages and have there any indication from that as to what the readership is? I know, Boris, what's it say at the back of that book that you have? What's the tirage? Do they say anymore? I don't think they say the tirage anymore. I, I kind of suspect that that yeah. might go the way of all. But so in the old days, you could always tell how many books at least had been published, if not um, how many that had circulated. In the, in the, in the 80s, when, when she published, there, there were... Uh, it was big, uh, yeah. Like million and... Uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay, she, uh, yeah. that, that was be, uh, they, they were best-selling books. I think uh, lately, before um, um, the 
Nobel Prize, I don't think yeah. that uh, they were published with uh, sort of the big number of copies. I don't remember. I don't think. So again, if we think about how her career happened, 1985 is that moment of. This is 10,000. 10,000? That's sort of collected and, works. And, uh, um, uh, and that's already after uh, Nobel Prize. Mm -hmm. And I have one of them, one like that, uh, from that collection in the American Library that I got. So therefore, you know, some of them are going abroad. But when we look at how, you know, these, especially these first two books, uh, were really about that moment when everybody was reading everything and everything was coming out. If you could get paper, you could publish an enormous, remember the story that Tatiana Tolstaya tells a story about, um, she was publishing her, her first work, her first collection of short stories at Moskovsky Rabochi, maybe in 85, maybe later, and she had to um, bring her own paper. They said, we'd be happy to publish you, but bring your own paper. <laughs> right. So, but I was, I mean, one of the things that I find so fortunate about my own life in Soviet studies is that I was there in 87, I was there for the year in 88, 89. So I was, you know, subscribing to all of these literary journals, and I was a part of that million, million person strong uh, uh, reading public um, that really saw, and everybody got really tired of it, I think, too, in Russia. When things actually started to get bad, nobody wanted to read, you know, any kind of uh, any kind of uh, um, revelations about how bad things were. Um, they just wanted to then do other things. Well, thank you all so much for being a great audience, those of you who really stuck it out to the end. Thank you.